thinning the ranks, using vaccines as a political weapon, U.S. military leaders have wrecked the forces' combat readiness and morale, current and former soldiers tell Tablet. And so here's the pretty great um, image, <clears throat> image that runs with the, with the piece. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I have some excerpts highlighted. That mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a long piece. I highly recommend it. We'll link to it in the show notes. I highly recommend the whole thing. But uh, sorry, I'm making people dizzy. Uh, here's the first excerpt from the military standpoint. The mandate was not just a matter of life and death, but also of national security. Uh, so I should I should say um, they're t they're talking specifically about military vaccine mandates, which you also um, had a conversation. And actually, he cites he cites your conversation on Dark Horse in was it like October or November of last year? October twenty two. I had uh, two, uh, two your, two your conversations. conversations with a total of six or seven um, uh, former. And I think it was five, and then uh, an attorney associated with their their claim. Uh, um, uh, people in the active members of the military. Yep. Yeah. So from the military standpoint, the mandate was not just a matter of life and death, but also of national security. If infection swept to the ranks due to troops refusing to take available vaccines, not only would that destroy morale and discipline, but it could also leave the country unable to respond to an attack or emergency. The problem with this argument is twofold. First, COVID-19 never posed a significant acute risk to healthy young people, the very demographic that overwhelmingly makes up the military, which means the vaccination drive was, at best, unnecessary. Secondly, according to several sources, the military's approach to the vaccines, rather than emphasizing combat readiness, was used as a disciplinary tool to enforce political conformity and punish independent thought and ideological dissent. That's an important sentence right there. I've seen everything from don't ask, don't tell repeal to gay marriage legalized to people are allowed to put gay pride flags in their offices now, said a member of an elite infantry unit with over a decade of service. The jarring thing, he explained, was that the same military that boasts about its tolerance became rigidly intolerant on the question of bodily autonomy and vaccines. Quote, you can get exemptions for religious beards if you're Muslim. You can get exemption to wear headgear instead of your issued hat. That's fine. I'm all for it. If you can do the job, you should be allowed to do it. But then, for a vaccine that's violating the Nuremberg Code, and all of a sudden we're the problem, that's what's bizarre to me. Many of those who refused the vaccines did so on the grounds that the mandate violated the Nuremberg Code of Ethics for permissible medical experiments. The first line of the code reads, quote, The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Those citing the code point out that these COVID vaccines had not even finished their clinical trials at the time troops were being pressured and or mandated to take them, and were therefore being asked to sacrifice their Nuremberg-derived rights. Health authorities in the U.S. dismissed that claim on the grounds that the vaccines had received emergency authoriz authorizations and were therefore not strictly experimental. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something there, or I should go to the next excerpt. Yeah, I, d I do want to add something. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a general comment about... You know, obviously, uh, since I had covered this story, some of this wasn't new to me. On the right. other hand, there was, the story is quite exhaustive. And what it revealed to me was that what we saw informally play out in the wider world, right? The bullying that took place over people's justifiable skepticism of new so-called vaccine technologies, that that played out in the military in a very different way because of the formalized uh, hierarchy, right? The military requires a formalized hierarchy, which means that essentially everybody except the lowest rank was in a position to boss somebody else around. And so to the extent that you were formally empowered to do this, people took on a kind yes. of, uh, you know, cinema... Uh, drill sergeant approach to getting the people below them in line. Yeah. And this is so diabolical in, in a case where people had just a normal right to feel caution about a technology that was brand new that they were being told that they needed for a disease that was not killing people in their circles. This, you know, it's not killing healthy young people. Right. And that right vanished. And then the other thing is, and I wish the piece hit this note harder, the fact that by purging people, by driving them out, making their lives a living hell, and then formally purging them from the ranks if they refused at the point that the mandates uh, became viable. We have created a force that is now 
compliant, yep. right? A military force that will now accept immoral orders, including violations of a code that was produced at no small cost in U.S. military lives. Yes, fully aside from the medical implications and autonomy implications and personal health implications. The mandates were a selective force that has created a compliant military. Yep. And we need, because of what the military is, uh, because of the, of the need for hierarchy, there needs to be um, compliance within reason which is to say there needs to be compliance and reason. Every single soldier needs to do what they are told in times of duress and also needs to be keeping their brain alive and thinking, you know what? Not that order. No, sir. Not that order. They need, we need a force that, that can and does and will stand up to unethical orders when they come. And what we have had here is a selective force, a selective pressure uh, to create a compliant force that will not. Um, now, the, the piece does say, and I, and I have a few more excerpts, including one extended excerpt here to, to read, does say that many people, um, in, some, in some units, um, the estimation is a majority of people who ended up vaccinated were resistant, um, feel that they were duped, um, felt that they had no choice because they need to support their families, and were never pleased about it. So, um, I, you know, that, that provides hope, right? Uh, that it's not that uh, people did the thing and went like, oh, wow, being compliant feels great. I feel terrific. I'm going to go about my day now. Like, no, I think in some ways, actually, you may have people uh, who now have um, more reticence uh, to unethical orders than they did before, but who are still in the military, I, I hope. Well, uh, But I think it's at least a possibility. Yeah, I, I agree that that's a possibility. I think people are wide awake in a way that um, these maniacs who uh, built this policy did not anticipate. And I think in large measure that happened because a small number of channels that they did not control, including this one, uh, were able to reveal that their narrative was garbage. Yep. Um, but, so what we can say is, what were they trying to do? I don't know if they were trying to create a compliant force, but it's certainly interesting that they deployed a policy that would have that as a natural consequence. Right. So, you know, from the point of view of uh, what William Binney called the turnkey totalitarian state, you know, you can't have a turnkey totalitarian state if the military is fighting for the freedom of Americans, uh, including their rights under Nuremberg, right? You have to do something to make the force deaf to Nuremberg, and this would be something you would do. The fact that it didn't work mm -hmm. doesn't indicate anything about the policy being less diabolical than it was, because it was quite diabolical. Yeah. But um, it, uh, you know, yes, it did not work as well as they might have liked. A little bit more from, sure. from Fox and Tablet this week. The COVID-19 mandate forms part of a pattern of vaccination. You want to share my screen here? Uh, the COVID-19 mandate forms part of a pattern of vaccination controversies in the U.S. military. In the first Gulf War, over 150,000 U.S. troops were vaccinated against the anthrax bacterium, which military brass feared might be used by Saddam Hussein on American troops. Parenthetically, notably, the United States also sold Saddam's spores and technology that might have allowed Iraq to produce weaponized anthrax. One problem with the anthrax vaccine was that any expected weaponization of anthrax would come through an inhaled exposure, and the vaccine the military mandated had only been tested in humans against exposure through the skin. In spite of the fact that the anthrax vaccine wasn't licensed for prevention of disease via inhalation, in 1998, the DOD pushed forward with a military-wide mandate. Subsequently, a small group of soldiers refused to take it, with at least 500 eventually being thrown out of the military. Along the way, many were placed in military prison for their refusals. Prior to the mandates, in 1997, a new section was added to Title X of the U.S. Code, the Consolidation and Codification of the General and Permanent Laws of the United States, requiring the Department of Defense to inform soldiers any time they are being asked to take an investigational drug, the reasons why, and any possible side effects that might arise, as well as garner consent for administration. The only way for informed consent to be waived is by a written waiver from the President, and only if it's deemed necessary for national security. This was reaffirmed in an executive order signed by President Clinton in 1999. But the DOD didn't consider the anthrax vaccine investigational, in spite of it being used in an unauthorized manner, and so they didn't feel the need to get a waiver. 
In 2001, then Attorney General of Connecticut Richard Blumenthal advocated for the mandates to be thrown out due to the lack of a presidential waiver and concerns about quality control issues and FDA violations in its manufacturing. He wrote a letter to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld arguing that, quote, in effect, the military is forcing its personnel to serve as human guinea pigs for an unlicensed drug that has not been proven to be safe or effective, end quote. Blumenthal, now a Democratic senator, has taken a very different view of the COVID vaccine. In January 2021, Blumenthal told reporters, quote, we need these vaccines to go in the arms of our veterans and into the arms of all Americans, end quote. Tablet has reached out to Senator Blumenthal's office for comment on why the unlicensed COVID vaccines were different from the unlicensed anthrax vaccines. We have received no reply. The anthrax vaccine mandate, this is the last of this little section, the anthrax vaccine mandate was thrown out after six years with the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia issuing a permanent injunction in Doe versus Rumsfeld. But the legal backlash spurred the creation of an entirely new des- designation within the FDA, the Emergency Use Authorization. Codified in the 2004 Project BioShield Act, Congress created a pathway for the FDA to authorize unapproved biologics for emergency use in an imagined bioterror attack. Wasting no time, the FDA granted the anthrax vaccines in EUA in January 2005, which then allowed the military to resume anthrax vaccinations, though only on a voluntary basis. By year's end, the FDA had given the anthrax vaccine full licensure for use against inhalational anthrax, and the military mandates were back in force for troops headed to regions with a higher risk of biological warfare. Looking back, Dale Saran, a former Marine aviator and JAG who represented anthrax vaccine refusers and who is now a civil attorney, told Tablet that he believes, quote, anthrax was the trial run. Saran thinks that at least some of what drove the push for COVID-19 vaccines inside the military is simply profit. Quote, the biggest government contractors have always been the Raytheons. All of a sudden, with the biodefense thing, Pfizer is like the third largest defense contractor. The biotech pharmaceutical industry saw that they could wedge their way in and get a chunk of that fat Department of Defense pipeline. So a couple of things that should be added here. Um, One, there is substantial evidence that the anthrax vaccination campaign is actually the explanation for what was called Gulf War syndrome. Right. Right. So this was a potentially a trial run here where uh, the initial case, and I think the first EUA that was granted was granted for the anthrax vaccine in this case. Um, so anyway, rather like uh, if you read The Real Anthony Fauci uh, by Robert Kennedy Jr., yep. you see that actually there is a precursor case surrounding AIDS in which a lot of the tropes were deployed for the first time. Um, and, you know, it's basically a rerun. The COVID version is a rerun of many things that we had already seen with AIDS. In many ways in the military, the anthrax uh, vaccine campaign is uh, a a notable precursor of the same pattern that surrounded COVID. Yep. Um, so yeah, completely, um, shocking how this unfolded in the military context, especially in light of what the military is needed to do. I mean, they deployed a vaccine whose safety they didn't know anything about or very little, uh, on a force that is necessary to protect the Republic. 